welcome to this week's Hocus Focus episode 16. I'm Sarah Mondaini. And I'm Thomas Sheridan. And thank you for joining us again as we explore the weird and unexplained from around the world and take you on a journey through high strangeness and a 40 feast of the mysterious and the curious. So how's life been treating you this week, Thomas? That's been pretty cool. Uh, things have settled down a little bit. Though there is extreme psychic weather going on, which we'll be talking about. I've been really enjoying reading the comments on the video and everybody's been so lovely and so supportive. And, and thank you for that. I, I love the idea that we help you ease into Monday a little bit easier. easier. But uh, I did a little megalithic uh, uh, adventures this week with Neil MacDonald and you'll be seeing a little bit of that later. And uh, yeah, it was pretty good this week. The weather was fantastic until yesterday. It's still dry, but it suddenly got very cold. What about there? Yeah, it's the same. It can be dry and warm one minute and then hailstone in the next. So just can't judge it, really. You end up having three or four seasons in one day at the moment. But we'll get there. It's trying. It's trying to, to come in the hot it's weather. Trying. Yeah, the two days we had Monday and Tuesday, we had w w very warm, humid weather and blazing sunshine. So... It did feel like, even though it's cold today, it's the weather, the sun is winning. Our first topic tonight is concerning a 14 event that is probably the most well documented, researched, but also the most misleading of all time. And that is the miracle of the sun at Fatima which took place on the 13th of October, 1917. Now, we already spoke in a previous episode of Focus Focus about the three secrets of Fatima. Well, the Fatima thing just goes on and on. But for me, the main show in all this, and for everyone, including devout Catholics, is the final public apparition of uh, the lady that appeared in Fatima to the three children, Jacinta, Lucia, and Francisco. In 1916, it began. Now, the story is completely different than the narrative which the Jesuits created. It was a classic story of something 40 and that happened. There may have been involvements with other sinister groups such as certain Freemasonic organizations. We don't know, but the fact is it was still a 40th event that happened. And it's a more complex story than just three children seeing the Madonna. Before the apparitions began, newspapers in Porto and in Lisbon had a small ad printed in them by a spiritualist group saying, that some incredible supernatural event was going to happen in Portugal soon that would change the destiny of the nation forever. Now, Portugal at the time was under a Republican government. I think it was their first Republican government. And the country was very unstable. World War I was going on. The, uh, the, the communists were trying to seize power from the, from the Republican government. And in the midst of all this, three children in Fatima in Portugal out in the field one day claimed that they saw a brilliant lady that was brighter than the sun that looked incredibly angelic and taught and believed it was an angel and the thing started communicating with them now, in reality, what they saw was a short creature about three foot tall that appeared near a cave and then on top of a tree. Now, this is, I'll explain the significance of the caves later on. And told the children that they must sacrifice and pray for saving the world, saving Portugal, and so on. Uh, the children, this is in 1916 now, uh, the children went back and there was a few more periods of having these events. Uh, when these happened initially, in fact, every time it happened, the children were very ill and disoriented and uh, were not were obviously not 
positively affected by the experience. Lucia, the oldest girl, decided to make a pact with the two other kids to not tell their parents about it. But the little girl Jacinta did. She told her mother and the mother took her to the priest. And the priest said, well, let, 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 her, let them keep going. Let's see what happens to these events. So eventually these were, it, it culminated in the children uh, being told about the, the world, uh, that there were secrets to be given, that the war would end if people turned back to the rosary and made sacrifices. And there's all kinds of events went on until the final event in October 1917. It started really on the 13th of May and went every month they were told to appear at the same place. The, the cave and the, the tree where the lady, the lady appeared. The, uh, the final event, they said that the woman or the lady who was now calling herself the, the Virgin Mary uh, would give an event that would prove that the children were not lying. So 70,000 people appeared at the site where the children went before the tree. And while the children were in their typical kind of trance talking to the top of the tree, some people already began to see paranormal effects. They saw strange mists around the top of the tree, and they also heard what sounded like electronic buzzing noising, very significant. Then uh, something happened and Lucia said that the lady pointed to the sun and she told everyone to look at the sun. It had been raining ferociously for two days. And these poor Portuguese, you know, just poor country people were standing knee deep in mud, 70,000 of them. There was also soldiers there in case any trouble started. The government had already arrested the children. The local regional government had already arrested the children and threatened to execute them if they, if for, for, you know, if they didn't say they were lying, because the government started to worry about this because it was a staunchly atheistic government, although it was full of Freemasons. And um, then the miracle of the sun happened. The sun appeared to change colors, spin and rotate, send, sending off beams of light. It became significantly duller and started moving towards the 70,000 the people started screaming in terror, believing it was the end of the world. It hovered down to earth, shot off all beams, zigzagged and floated like this, spiraled out and it shot back up into the sky and stored itself as the normal sun. In between that, people said that they felt that these, what they call angel dust, is this kind of powder fell from the sky. It's like, almost like gossamer, that it didn't it dissolved as soon as you touched your hand. Very often associated with alien uh, UFO sightings. And when they looked down, the mud on the ground that had been, they were, up, they were nearly up to their knees in, was all dry and their clothes were all dry. And all the, the dampness and everything had gone. And it was like there had never been any rain. People fell to their knees. The, the skeptics say there was loads of cameras there. Why was it not a good picture? It was 1917. They didn't have SLR cameras. They didn't have high-tech cameras back then. You know, you're going to have to have a hard time filming, photographing something like that. But they fell to their knees. Communists who went there to mock it fell to their knees, declaring their, their life to the Trinity and the Rosary, and all this kind of thing went on. Now, then the then their children were given the three secrets of Fatima, which is uh, basically that Russia would return back to the fate, that the war would end, but it didn't end until a year after the children said. And then the children were shown these horrifying visions. Now, this is also significant as well, and I'll talk about this later when we're Sarah and I are discussing it. Now, Lu Lu Lucia claims she was told that Francisco and Jacinta wouldn't be alive much longer. And the following year, the two children died in the Spanish flu influenza outbreak in 19, 1919. And they were, the only survivor was Lucia. And she died in 2005. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. She was constantly badgered over the years by both the bishops in Portugal 
and the Vatican to write her story down. And she claims that the Madonna or the lady or the figure had visited her all the time while she was in the convent. She became a nun in Portugal. But not long after the events happened in the 1920s, she was already doubting if she had been fooled. And that this was, this was, this was not a messenger from heaven, but actually the work of the devil. And she was having nightmares of the devil laughing at her and so on. And she was basically locked in a convent for the rest of her life. Now, that's the, that's the gist of the main story. But it goes deeper than that. Basically, what happened was the Fatima events happened. The children's stories were incredibly inconsistent, even when they were under interrogation in prison and threatened with debt. They never wavered in their stories. Uh, the events were officially documented and seen. There's even videos of people on YouTube who saw the events when they were young kids. It happened. It was real. It was a massive 14 event. But it wasn't what Catholics were told they are. A film was made in the 50s about the Lady of Fatima. And it showed as a classic Virgin Mary story. In reality, they saw an entity. They saw a being that ranged from a female to something that looked like a fairy with no hair that made a clicking noise and rotated. The, the whole story of it being the Virgin Mary was invented basically by a church who coached it, coached, who basically coached him into believing it, and the entity too as well. But they, they did not see a beautiful, they did not see the classic Virgin Mary as, say, St. Bernadette claims to have seen in, in Lourdes. This was, a, this was, by all accounts, what we would call an alien UFO event. Now, I'm not saying it's aliens. I'm just saying it was in that, that scene. For example, in alien abductions, people are, always, are often deliberately traumatized and shown images of the end of the world. This was done to the children. Uh, remember when we reviewed Whitley Strieber's communion, and he was crying, the end, the world is over, my boy is dead, and he was weeping. That's very common in these events. Another thing, too, was uh, that um, the children were disoriented and sick and not well and had difficulty eating every time this the Madonna appeared. And that's also common with people who've been involved in alien abduction episodes. And finally, i leave it with this. The town of Fatima... It's not named after the Muslim name. It's, it's a, that's a myth. But it was an Islamic caliphate under the Berbers. And in the Berber Islamic tradition, they have an, a jinn-worshipping ancestor cult where women go into caves and communicate and get prophecy. And this is exactly what happened to these children. The entity appeared out of a cave. And we know caves are the domain of the jinn and so on. So that's the Fatima story. Uh, if you're a Catholic out there and hearing this version of it for the first time, what you're hearing is the real version for the first time and not the one written by the Jesuits. So there you go, Sarah. So do you think this is somehow related to the jinn in the Middle East and the connection there through the Catholic Church? Um, because they wanted to ban non-Catholic pilgrimages to Fatima um, and also... I thought the Fatima name was an Arabic name. Was that, Am I wrong there? No, you're right. But it's always said there's a, there's a fairy tale story of a, it was written by a monk of a Christian knight who captured an Islamic princess and she compared to the Christianity and her name was supposed to be Fatima. But that's not true. It's actually probably is an Islamic name, but it was much older from when that was, in the, when that was the Iberian Caliphate and it was run by Berbers. And the Berbers were, yeah, absolutely. They were the Berbers are involved in these strange ancestor wor worships in caves and in and in tombs. And on top of that, the um, you that story you mentioned. What happened there was in the nineteen, I think it was the nineteen nineties. Yeah, nineteen nineties. A an author in Portugal wrote a book talking about how it was a Berber, it was a Berber Islamic thing. And what happened then was it was the book was distributed all over Iran 
and was made into a movie and they were claiming that that Iran was that that Fatima was actually a a you know a religious site for Muslims and the church had to get involved at one time point and stop and tell the Israel the Portuguese church and tell the, the Iranian embassy we're not issuing any more tourist visas to uh, Muslims from Iran. Yeah. On top of that, uh, Fatima is also, my, my friend Shifa O'Donovan wrote a beautiful article on her recent visit there. It's also a major shrine from Hindus as well, because Hindus believe that Catholics are pagans because of all the saints. And Fatima is one of the reasons why they think Catholics are actually really pagans. But um, yeah, that's that's that it's just remarkable the stories about uh, the thing of the two children dying francisco and jacinta now this is really interesting the year before they died the children were acting very strange they wouldn't eat anything and they said they were they'd have to do penance for being bad and doing something bad and i suspect that jacinta and Frances francesco probably started to realize it was the what they in their minds the work of the devil it wasn't the work of god and they found the children were binding themselves and cutting themselves and drinking water from puddles not from the, the water from the well the water supply and as soon as the spanish flu came along the children were so weak and so sick it killed them and this was the same time lucia who was the oldest of the three kept on saying she was having nightmares of the devil laughing at her and believe writing in her diary that the devil had fooled her and it wasn't actually an angel from heaven. It doesn't strike me as a particularly holy event, um, not least because of what you've just said there, but also uh, with the three secrets, um, one that was warned about Russia would see it's the error of its ways unless it that Russia would, um, well, something would happen to Russia unless it was consecrated into Mary's Immaculate Heart. And it just doesn't strike me as what I would expect somebody as holy as Mary to come down here and say to get politically biased like that. Yeah, well, it happened to St. Bernadette and Lourdes as well. She got, she got cancer of the leg and told nobody about it in the monastery. And when the Mother Superior uh, looked at her legs, underneath her gowns her legs had been eaten to the bone by tumors and did, did mother mary if that was mother mary would she have let allowed bernadette to go through that hell on earth yeah it just does not strike me as being holy what what the what you're saying makes more sense all the um non-supernatural um explanations have been blown out of the water yeah. because some people saw it happen there and other people didn't see anything and some people just saw the sky change color so everybody there saw different things so if it was some kind of um sky phenomena like uh, sun dogs which where the sun has a halo and sometimes look like looks like there's two suns then everybody would have witnessed that not just a portion of of the audience but they all witnessed the water evaporating and also it wasn't hallucinatory per se because 25 miles away people saw it and didn't know what was going on so it some it did happen but people do often perceive 14 events differently you know in ghost hunts and things like this or whatever they often have different stories it, it it's a mixture of perception plus experience but what i think happened was the Freemasons and the Jesuits got together in Portugal and the Freemasons, in order to shut it down, agreed with the Catholic Church to make it into a miracle. And it wasn't long after, like in the 1920s or so on, that the uh, the church in Portugal started really seriously working on this being, you know, an actual spiritual, a real spiritual event. And, that the, you know, all three children have now been canonized as saints so they made they they've legitimized the Marian apparition part, even though the children themselves didn't believe it. Well, they had doubts about it. So all those pilgrim, all those pilgrims that go there year after year, um, praying and and being thankful for whatever that was, that they're inadvertently then praying and giving thanks to a demon. 
or a gin, most likely. I a think, gin, yes. yeah. yeah. And, on, and on top of that, uh, it, the, the event wasn't really well known outside that part of Portugal until the Catholic Church paid Hollywood to make a movie about it. And this is a big flash Hollywood movie about Our Lady of Fatima. And that was made in the 50s. And then suddenly the cult of Fatima exploded. Had something gone on there prior to the um, appearance to the children for that part of the world to be? I don't understand why that part of the world or, or what summons it or what caused that to take place. Why did they? Well, I don't know. Why Lourdes? Why Medjugorje? Why Nock? Why, you know, Guadalajara? There was a Marian apparition that happened in Bavaria in the 1860s that the whole town, it's one of the most most you know well documented things and they're always obscure places they're never anywhere of any importance have you ever been no no i've never been to portugal i've never been to fatima i want to go though right i want to go yeah and so like i wanted i wanted to do a film on it and, and go there and, and film it to get the thing but yeah i want i want i want to know more there's a few books written about in portuguese and there's one translated into english which I can't find, I have around the house somewhere. I have friends in Portugal, I was talking to last year, on uh, my Facebook friends list, and he was saying that oh, it, was, it, it was probably the Masons tricking the population with like, with like a magic lantern or something like that. And though I wouldn't put that past them, uh, the fact is that other things did happen. I think it's one of those things that the 14th event happened and it became politically useful, you know? Sorry, the thing that sets off the alarm bells there is the, the 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 advertisement that appeared in the news the two newspapers announcing that some an event was going to happen in Portugal soon that would change the country forever? The Pope that gave it that canonized it, I forget the name, Pope Pius the Thirteenth, was it? I don't remember the numbers. Um No, he... it was not Paul who canonized the canonized them, I think, but Pope I think it was Pope Lewis or one of them. You're right though. He had beatified them. Uh, but when you hear this one, when you hear this for spookiness, one of the things that is needed for sainthood, beatification, is non-corruption of the body, like it doesn't rot. So St. Bernadette's body in Lourdes, you can actually see it. She looks like the day she died. Uh, when Lucia died in her cell in the convent, they just locked it shut and left it there. For years, the check of the body had de decomposed or not. And it hadn't decomposed, and then she was declared a saint. Isn't that weird shit? Yeah. Yeah, something's happened, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I saw an interview with her, I think, what was it, her? I saw it, no, it was, no, it was an interview. She was when she'd met Pope John. She actually became friends with Pope John Paul. They actually became friends. And he was very fond of her, like maybe like he saw her as like a, a, a you know a grandmother or an an elderly aunt or something, and um, you get the impression that that woman was a tortured soul in some way. The you know that she the okay the other two died, but she was, had to live and be the kind of spokesperson for the whole thing. And remember, it happened in it started in nineteen sixteen, and the woman didn't die until 2005 she was in her 90s and she had to live all that time with it you know yeah and then to have nightmares of the devil laughing at her and then maybe to slowly come to the realization of what he actually was rather than what what she'd been told or what she thought it was yeah and then bishops and popes and everything totally bugging you to write uh letters of write write your memoirs about it wow yeah the miracle of the sun did happen uh, but it's like any other 14 event. Like, it makes you wonder about things like Roswell and lots of other things. How many? Oh, another thing, the, 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 the Madonna, the Virgin Mary said that on the there would be another war to come soon that would be even worse than the Great War they were having it then. And before it happened, a sign would appear in the sky. Well, a remarkable event happened in the eve of the Third Reich's annexing of Austria in 1938, which is ostensibly was the beginning of World War II. And there was an incredible light show seen in the skies all over Europe that no one could properly explain. 
they said it was auroras, but they said it was it was it like lit up the day, it lit up the sky like day. It was seen, and it was only over Europe, but it was so bright it was seen on the east coast of America coming from Europe. So that prophecy came true as well. And we know that the Third Reich came to power with all kinds of, like I wrote a book about it, Bob Burgess, Mike, with all kinds of spookiness and all kinds of other things like that going on. It's, yeah. It's, 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 what, it's, what it's it, it, I don't know what's spookier for it to be a holy thing or whether it to be the gin. I don't know. It's, it's, it, but I'll tell you one thing it's, it's proof of the paranormal. That's the end mm -hmm. of it. I mean, if people say to me, can you show me anything that's proof of the paranormal? I say at the miracle of the son of Fatima. I had a friend in New York years ago. Sort of, he was like, uh, he was kind of like a lapsed Catholic, uh, Irish American guy, and he said to me, uh, "Have you ever seen? I saw a documentary the night about Fatima, and I go, oh yeah, yeah, very interesting." He goes, "It really makes you understand that word true religion, you know." So it became a propaganda weapon for the for the church, yeah, for the Catholic Church. Well, yeah, I mean, if you have, if anyone has any theories on Fatima, you know, light up the comments. Have you ever been there or anything like that? And uh, but I th I'm sure many of you are in shock because it's the first time you've heard the story. But I can guarantee you, there are other sources out there. Check it. It's just that's exactly what happened. The whole thing of the Madonna was a reframing of a very strange story that had a lot of similarity to both gin and alien abduction effects, and that would be right if, if she was still alive. Uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley Street, because she was the one who said they were the same thing. There was something about the third secret that Pope Benedict, who we talked about in episode two, I think it was, didn't want to be made public because he said it would bring down the Catholic Church from the inside. But you wonder how true that is, though, or if it's just generating a mystique. Did you ever hear about that Benedictine monk? Who hijacked the the Irish airliner and covered himself in petrol? If he didn't, and was going to set the plane on fire if he didn't. Uh, yeah, he was some nut job. A friend of mine here made a movie, a film about him. It was an award-winning film, and um, he hijacked a, a plane. Was flying from Dublin to Paris, and he hijacked it. He was, I think, he was American. He was American or Swiss. I can't remember. But he was a monk, and he went to the bathroom and covered himself in petrol, and said he would set the plane on fire if the Vatican didn't reveal the third secret. And uh, the French commandos are, got him off the plane without shooting him. He was very lucky, actually. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually the third secret thing has driven people nuts. I wonder if Pope Benedict knew the truth about what the whole thing was, like what we're talking about now. I think he did. I think he did, yeah. I think he did. I think the more I learned about Benedict, the more I liked the guy. And uh, yeah, I think Pope John Paul II too, knew as well, too knew as well. And uh, that, you know, the, it's ironic that they're kind of like uh, so much of so much of history and the Vatican and all that stuff and the, the three secrets, uh, three, three shepherd girls, three shepherd children in Portugal in 1916. It's one of those things of like a small event can have ripples around the world. There's so many stories from the Vatican and, and miracles and things, and all roads seem to lead back to Middle East and Jin. Yeah. And a lot of the places that have been where the same famous part, Medjugorje, I think Guadalajara in Spain, uh, definitely not Lourdes, but it was on the there was battles in Lourdes with the Muslims, but they never conquered it. And definitely Fatima were all Islamic caliphates at one time. Medjugorje was in the sorry, Medjugorje was in the Ottoman Empire, so they were all Islamic at one point, which is just remarkable. So that's the the miracle of the son of Fatima. Look at just check it out. Watch this. I saw one very good, like a short documentary on it where the guy covered it in a in a 14 kind of way rather than the church kind of way. But uh, it, I, I just use it as an excuse that, like, yeah, the paranormal is real. But also, government shenanigans and black magic is real too.
It's that time again where Thomas and I review some of the folklore horror films that have had an imp impact on us over the years. Those films that bring about nostalgia, a sense of hauntology and enjoyment. And this week we are reviewing the 1962 black and white horror film Carnival of Souls, directed by Herc Harvey and featuring Candice Hilligoss as the leading lady. And the film tells the story of Mary, a young woman who is the sole survivor of a car accident. After the accident, she moves to Utah to start a new life and takes a job as an organist at a local church. But strange things start happening to her and she suspects that she's been haunted by a ghostly figure. She starts to experience the sense of being invisible to other people a number of times throughout the film where she's talking to people and they're just not aware that she's there. And other times everything is back to normal again. And the film leads up to an otherworldly like finale where right at the last few frames of the film, you instantly understand why these things have been happening to her. And you realise that the events were perhaps not as ghoulish as you first thought they were. The film was shot in an almost dreamlike sequence that makes you feel like you're right there in the middle of it. And the haunting otherworldly music that accompanies the film only adds to that sort of eerie feeling. But it's not just the visuals and the music that make this film so great. The lead actress, Candice Hilligoss, delivers an etheric performance as Mary. And despite being filmed in 1962, she has a very modern day look about her. And even though it's a low budget film with a relatively small and unknown cast, Carnival of Souls is a classic horror film. There was no blood and no gore. There was no special effects. It was all done by playing on the psyche through the atmospheric cinematography and storytelling. So if you like old black and white eerie supernatural films as I do, then you'll really enjoy this one. And another interesting fact to go with my review is that the director, Herc Harvey, also appears in the film as the ghoulish-looking man who is stalking her. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a cult classic for a reason. It's, it's amazing. And it's one of these films that shouldn't work, but absolutely does. I think it's because of the atmosphere, and some of the camera work is very impressive. It, it's shot in... It's very bright at times. I believe, although it's set in Utah, I believe it was shot in Lawrence, Kansas, where the sun tends to be very intense and bright. And he didn't use he didn't put things like polarizing filters on the black and white cameras, which they do in westerns to make the sky the clouds really stand out from the, from the dark sky, and uh, like in the John Ford westerns. But it's not like it's 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 it that just adds to the dreaminess that you feel like you're in a dream that eventually becomes a nightmare. But there's almost these cornball acting scenes that have it's like david lynch kind of almost like autistic quality like where she screams at the guy at the water fountain and he goes i meant no harm and then the psychiatrist goes come over to my office and uh the guy in the apartment building where she is he's trying to hit on her the view is great he was like he played that sleaze ball perfectly loser you know but uh the you know the the scene there's lots of scenes like that, the way that, 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 that when she gets she gets fired from her job as an organist for heresy, blaspheme, then the, the, the way that the, the minister goes is like, but we want to help you after he fires her. Uh, in a very kind of like robotic way, I absolutely love the motif of the resort town on the edge of the desert with the old railway line going to it and the old abandoned merry-go-round dance halls and all this kind of thing slides and that really just i've always found like seaside towns in the winter to be spooky and beautiful oh you know the old-fashioned seaside towns and i definitely captured that vibe it, it's i watched it the other night for this review and it's the first time i've seen it in a very long time and i have to say it only gets better it only it only i thought it'd be like laugh thinking it's corny or a bit goofy but it's, no it only got better when she's at that, that end you know it is genuinely terrifying when she's running between the bus station and the train station trying to get a ticket home when she can't go home because she's she, she's not alive anymore the that's it and then, then the sounds stop you know 
and then you know there's no sound and um southbound bus at platform 15 and that's all it comes through on the speaker and she goes down and all the people in the bus are all ghouls and spooks and stuff like that and the scene where the psychiatrist turns around in the chair and he's 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 the, the, the ghoulish man as well i know that's still quite frightening yeah carnival of souls just what can you say brilliant I think it works with the seaside resort and the fairground and the theme park there because um, it when you're watching it, you see that and it reminds you of when you went to those places when you was younger and it was full of people and full of life and full of laughter. So to see those places not doing what they were built to do gives them a spooky element to them. And Big that's time. Yeah. That's the. I think that's kind of like. Am I right in saying that's the hauntology of something? Yeah, yeah. The sort of like what I call the environomicon, that kind of atmospheric thing. When the minister takes her to see it, he goes, "This used to be quite a place back in the day, but then the lake dried up and nobody came. They tried to make it into a dance hall, into all kinds of things, but it always flopped. Now, it's also a metaphor for her. It's a dead seaside town." Well, it's not by the sea, it's by a lake. It's a dead lakeside town. The lake dried up. The resort is gone. And she was a fancy lady, a young girl, it, it, you know, a bit of a wild chick, I get the impression at the beginning, in, in, the, in the car. And now she, that, that, that seaside town, a lakeside town, echoes her now living state. She's dead. It's dead. And... She the the lakeside holiday resort doesn't know it's dead, and she doesn't know she's dead. So it's very sophisticated writing by the uh, by the people who made the film. What I couldn't figure out was was she in purgatory, and everybody was dead, or was she dead and those people in that world were alive and they could see her sometimes as she faded in and out, and that's why sometimes. She could be heard and seen, and other times she couldn't. Yes, she was like a living ghost. She was kind of in that thing they call bardo, that state just after a person dies where you're here among the living and you can't contact it them. But because of that, I think the nature of the, the accident, how the car was knocked off the bridge and she comes out of the mud, you know, then there's all kinds of things that are coming. You know, they kept talking about how them, they'll never find that car because there's nothing but a deep mud under the bottom of that creek. And so she emerged from the subconscious almost. So she may have been imagining a lot of things as well. But when she goes to her last day at the organ company, they're all amazed by how beautifully she plays. It's like she becomes a better musician when she's dead. It's just so weird. Yeah, I, I, she was in that state of bardo. And it wasn't until that moment when they were chasing her on the beach and all the dead people grabbed her and then when they, when they later on the police and the and the minister went to the beach and her footprints just stopped that was the moment she died she was she accepted she was dead and that was the second that they pulled the car out of the creek yeah. Yeah. she had to be officially dead in the eyes of the authorities by the car removing the creek so it's like there's so many metaphors and allegories so what what people think is a kind of a cult classic, when people think of cult classics from American films, then they tend to be corny, like uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, you know. But this one, and this, this Carnival of Souls, unfortunately gets lumped in with that. But it's a far more sophisticated film than, than it's given credit for. I think ultimately it was a film about soul rescue, because they actually rescued her from that in between lineal liminal states. She because she was she wasn't dead, she wasn't alive. So they were coming to, to take her home, basically. Yeah, to do the dance of debt. Yeah. That was that final scene was the dance of debt. And uh, I love the way it started at the beginning and the end with the graphics sideways and the water shimmering, the way they used the title graphics. I thought that was that looked very funky for 1962, I thought. And it, it's one of these films that it, if it was made in colour, it wouldn't be the same. There's one scene where she walks from the sunlight into into the one, like one of the amusement centres inside the, 
inside the fairground. And I don't know how, I'm, I was, you know, just seeing again, we were watching films and figuring out how they did it. I don't know how the, the cinematographer got to do that shot because she comes out of full sunlight into this darkened room and she's still fully lit without the, the camera having, you know, whatever. He must have adjusted the S-stop or something while our exposure set and while he was, she was walking, which shows you that was like a pretty sophisticated camera work for a film using, you know, 35, 38 millimeter film, you know, cellulose film. It is. It's a, a, a good film and it's out there on YouTube in the uh, public domain. So it's quite an easy one to find this week. It's there. Maybe we'll put the link in the comments to the, the full length feature on YouTube. Yeah, I bought a DVD years ago uh, when it was hard to get. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's dead easy to get a copy now. Well, thanks for that, Sarah. That was excellent. Uh, next week's film is one of my all-time favourite films, and it is Quatermass and the Pit, not the 19, 1950s version made by the BBC in black and white, but the mid-1960s colour version made by Hammer Films. It is one of the best cosmic horror films. It has all the Lovecraftian elements, the Doctor Who elements, and everything else written by Nigel Neal, the great British uh, sci-fi cosmic horror writer, and it is possibly one of my, if I was to listen, my all-time favourite films of all time. I definitely put Quatermast and The Pit on that list in the top 10. And remember, it's the 1960s colour version made by Hammer and not the BBC black and white version that was made about 10 years previous for TV. So Quatermast and The Pit. And just to add one more thing to this, we're giving you for now the film that we're going to be reviewing in two shows from now after we review Quater Mast and the Pit and that is the TV miniseries of Salem's Lot with David Soule and James Mason from the late 1970s not anyone who saw that as a kid is probably still traumatized but it's because it's a miniseries it's something like seven or nine hours long we decided to announce it in advance so you could, as soon as you watch Quater Mast and the Pit, you can get right down to watching Salem Slot. So in two weeks' time, the film is, well, it's really a miniseries, Salem Slot, the Stephen King novel adapted for TV. And I still think the best TV movie ever made, starring James Mason and David Sowell. Our second topic this week is Willem Wright, an, Aust an Austrian physician and psychoanalyst, and he's best known for his work on orgone energy, a form of energy he believed existed in all living things. Reich was born in 1897 in Austria, and he studied medicine at the University of Vienna. He was a student of Sigmund Freud and became a prominent member of the psychoanalytic community in Vienna during the 1920s. Reich later broke away from the traditional psychoanalysis and developed his own theories, which he called orgonomy. Orgone energy is a form of life energy that exists in all, liv all living things, and he believes that that energy is responsible for all of our emotional and physical functions, and that a lack of orgone energy can lead to illness and disease. He developed the orgone accumulator, which he claimed could collect and concentrate orgone energy from the environment, and people could sit inside these um, boxes and he said the device could cure various ailments and the accumulators had a healthy effect on the blood and body tissue by providing the flow of life energy and releasing energy blocks. He also discovered motor force using orgone energy, claiming that it could propel motors from the body and the atmosphere. However, Reich's theories and practices were widely criticized by the scientific community 
and a journalist named Mildred Brady started a smear campaign through an article she wrote claiming that he was a dangerous individual who exploited his patients with his orgone accumulator boxes. He was eventually persecuted by the FDA and in 1954 they tried for an injunction complaining that orgone doesn't exist and they wanted to prohibit the shipment of the orgone accumulator devices and ban all of his public literature. The court granted it and ordered that all the devices were destroyed along with all the instructions for use and they also banned his books until any and all references to orgone energy were deleted. He also discovered orgone could affect the weather patterns by changing the amounts in the atmosphere and he developed and built his machine called the Cloud Buster. And farmers offered to pay him if he could bring rain to the area in order to save their blueberry crops. And 10 hours later, it started to rain and the crops were saved. But eventually he was convicted of fraud and sentenced to two years in prison in 1956, where he died eight months later of a heart attack. It was one of the most heinous acts of censorship in the United States history and all appeals were denied. Well, it sounds to me like he was onto something. All those journalists, negative press articles causing the government to get involved and the biggest censorship campaign in the history of the United States all sounds very familiar to what so many good people face when their views challenge established scientific thinking. Reich's work on orgone energy was influenced by his background in psychoanalysis and his interest in the relationship between emotional and physical health. And he believed that orgone energy was intimately tied to a person's emotional state and that a lack of it could lead to psychological as well as physical ailments. The concept of life energy, or chi, is present in many traditional healing systems, including acupuncture, Ayurveda, and traditional Chinese medicine. Some people view orgone energy as a Western analog to those concepts. I first, like many people, came across this work in the when Kate Bush released the album The Hounds of Love. There was a song called Cloud Busting and a beautiful song and that was made into a video with donald donald pleasance and uh, uh, Don, the canadian actor playing her father and she was playing uh, william reich's son and they were making the clouds and the song is all about the men in black she, uh, kate bush was a 40 by the way she was a member of them she was involved in local ufo groups and everything like that and she had heard about william reich and orgone energy through like what 40 in circles whatever and she because she had the money back then she was able to buy his books which were incredibly expensive the surviving copies and she said they were life-changing and that's what inspired her to write the book uh, the song cloud busting although he left freud's world he was still very much devoted to the sexual theory he's the one who invented the term the sexual revolution and he believed that sexual uptight, people being uptight about their sexuality was a cause of not just mental, emotional problems, but also physical problems, uh, illness. Now, that kind of makes a lot of sense when you think about it. And he invented his orgone accumulator, and it was called the, the sex healing box by people who didn't know what it meant. But he, was, he cured people of cancer, women with like very advanced stages of cancer. And it makes sense when you think about it, because the sexual instinct or the sexual libido, the energy, the vitality is associated with health generally and good and youth, good health, you know, young people and good health. And the idea of putting it, putting it in a bottle, so as to speak, in order to help people heal, that makes perfect sense when you ask me. It makes a lot of sense. And... Um, he was, he died of the heart attack in hospital, like the day, the day before he was supposed to go for his parole hearing. So there's a very good chance the FBI murdered him. And uh, he was beat up in custody, I believe, when he was first arrested. So the AMA in America and the federal government obviously went after this guy 
uh, because he, it, they, the same reason they went after people who invented cars that could run on water and stuff like that. You get inside the wrong people, they'll kill you. Uh, I think Willem Reich was definitely killed. It was, the smear campaign was definitely around that. And there's really, it, it's quite horrible what was done to the man. But I've never read any of his books. I'd like to, though. But apparently when he was doing his, he started out by doing psychology and sessions and classes. And people said he was tremendously charismatic, uh, great fun. Anyone who actually knew him personally said he was this um, very likable, intelligent, very down-to-earth character that was basically very approachable and likable and trustworthy. And uh, the last person in the world that should have been arrested as a monster and ba basically probably more than pussy. Yeah, it's a sad story. And it's uh, typical of what happens nowadays with um, people who have an alternative view or um, method or theory for health and well-being. In the age of needlecraft, what they did to him on a, on a on a singular scale, they've now done to the entire planet with what they call horse tranquilizers and, you know, all kinds of, they call it stuff snake oil that that would have, that did, was known to work. They declared a medicine that was, a, you know, a miracle medicine all over the world for curing everything. And so they decided overnight because it wasn't needle craft that it was, um, Horse, you know, it was horse, horse, horse tranquilizers. It was, um, it was snake oil. People have um, tried to replicate his accumulator boxes, haven't they, with the pyramid um, structures that you can buy now with the copper inside and, and the crystal inside. Have you seen those? Yeah, I don't know if they work or not. They're just like pieces of screws and copper wires inside yeah, resin. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if they work, but... No, they look pretty, but the the accumulator wasn't a um, it wasn't a pyramid. It was a box that you was big with a chair in it that you sat in, and we don't know what it was made of. We don't know what the cloud buster was made of, except that we have some rudimentary drawings of it that look like loudspeakers pointing at the sky and a cable that went into a a lake or a nearby river, and that was what actually cause the charge. You're right what you said at the beginning. It's all the same thing as chi, prana, and all these other things, you know, the and the the these unknown energies that different cultures have different names for, but they know they have a a beneficial healing effect. It's probably the same thing that the when they built the round towers in Ireland and discovered that they could help the soil. They were probably in fact I looked into Oregon as possibly them being an early form of an orgone accumulator. It might be, I just don't know yet. I just don't have the, the knowledge of orgone enough to have it. Now, those orgone things, they look pretty and everything, those pyramids, but all they are are bits of screws and a few other things thrown into a, a piece of resin. I don't know I don't know how, that, how that's supposed to work unless it makes you, look, makes you feel nice by looking at it. <laughs> no, I had to look into them. I had to look at them when I was researching for, for this section and apparently they you put them on the windowsill and places like that where there's a lot of electromagnetic energy you know around wi-fi routers and um where there's cell towers and things like that but i don't know how legitimate or how effective that is from a small resin pyramid or cube i don't i don't know it's like those the, the plastic sheeting in the in the uh supermarkets you have to cover your whole house in Oregon to protect you from that. And also, Oregon wasn't about shielding you from other things. It was about collecting an energy from outside and putting it into you. Yeah, it was more about harnessing it down, wasn't it, in, in, in a concentrated form and then giving it to you, sort of blasting your body with it when you sat down in the box. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it was, again, it was related to sexual energy. It makes sense, vitality, youth, health. Well, he also said that a lot of illnesses and um, uh, what's the word? Psychological states sort of arisen if a person's sex life wasn't satisfactory enough. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the Freudian thing again, wasn't it? He took, he took it one stage forward or he took the sexual theory to the, the health that it wasn't only causing mental health, it was causing physical health. In fact, I think when he first got to America, that's what his classes 
and his teaching courses were mainly about. Mm. And it was the it was the physical health that was the problem, not just neuroses. That was like what, what Freud was saying. It was just purely neuroses that would affect your relationships or your your mental all health. He said it was more than that. It was physical health. It was diseases and ailments and cancers and stuff like that. And I suppose back during those times, him being so open and um, talkative about those kinds of subjects, which especially in the United States, they were quite a taboo thing in um, oh, the actually the Bible yeah. Belt areas. So that they could pick that and use that as a perfect example to smear him and, and say that he was a dangerous individual who took advantage of his patients and students. And Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, if you're talking about the people who banned James Joyce's Ulysses, on the grounds that no Amer no decent American woman would have an orgasm. You know, that's how prudish they were, you know. It's like going back to the mother of Carrie, isn't it, from last week's Right movie. back to the Puritans, yeah. Yeah. So that was Willem Reich and Orgorn Energy, and Kate Bush seems to be creeping into the show more and more, but she is the queen of ontology. And um, if you have any opinions on those little resin pyramids, if they work for you, if I'm talking bollocks about it, if you think that you know what the, how the accumulators worked, or if you have any, if you read his books or have any of the rare ones or no one who does, you know, tell us about it because there's so little information out there, really, when you think about it. Uh, there's so many, so little real hard information about there because the books were all destroyed by the federal government. But, um, the wickedness of bureaucracy is should really be the legacy of Willem Reich's persecution. Uh, that when you have something good and something that can help humanity and you can't put a meter on it or can't price it, uh, they'll destroy it. And now it's time to find out if you can wash away your sins, uh, wash away your problems, wash away your negative energy and have a sense of restoration of the self and the spirit, your consciousness, and uh, a spruce up of the self. And this is Sarah with the psychic hygiene. There's been a lot of issues with water problems recently, leaks, bursts, and plumbing problems. So that's prompted this week's psychic hygiene because I'm trying to find a positive from it. So today I want to talk about the importance of water for maintaining psychic hygiene. Bringing water into your practice can have a profound effect on your overall well-being. Firstly, because water has a purifying effect on the energy field. So taking a cleansing bath or shower with the intention of releasing negative energy can help wash away any accumulated buildup from the day that's attached itself to your aura. And that can leave you feeling refreshed and rejuvenated. Water also has a calming effect on the nervous system. And the sound and feel of running water can help us relax and reduce stress and tension, which also has a positive effect on emotional well-being. Whether you take a walk by the river or the seaside or listening to the sound of rain or simply focusing on the flow of water in a meditation, spending time around water can help you calm your nervous system and feel more centred. Drinking water and staying hydrated is essential for maintaining our physical health, but it also plays a role in our psychic well-being. Water carries a life-giving force that can recharge our batteries when we feel drained or depleted, and it also has an effect on our consciousness. The reflective surface of water can mirror our inner self and offer us insights into our spiritual journey. In Esoteric circles, water is used as a tool for divination and scrying, and as its fluid and reflective nature, it can reveal hidden truths and messages from the spiritual realm or the subconscious. So there you have it. By taking a cleansing bath, spending time around water, staying hydrated, and using water as a tool for reflection and divination, if you're so inclined, you can cleanse your energy field, calm your nervous system, recharge your energy, 
and gain deeper insights into your spiritual journey. And that's my psychic hygiene suggestion for this week. Water, it reminded me of the power of seawater in curing your, your, when you're feeling bad. I used to find that when I had like something was bothering me or I wasn't feeling emotionally well, going into the cold sea and putting my head under the sea as, and holding my breath as long as I could and coming out of that, it was, it was like, it was like medicine. It was rem remarkable. The, I don't know if it was the iciness of the sea or the saltiness of the water, but there's also the electrical aspect of the salt and the saline and so on. But yeah, there's loads of putting your head in a flowing stream. There's all kinds of things with the, with the water. And we have like the holy wells and all this kind of stuff around the place, the healing waters. So I think that was a good idea to take all that problematic water we had and turn it into something positive. Yeah. And if that's not transmutation, I don't know what is. Our third and final story tonight takes us to Florida and the fascinating mystery of Coral Castle. And it's puzzled researchers and visitors with its incredible size and stunning design. And that's mainly because the castle was single-handedly built by a man named Edward Leedskullin, who claimed to have a vast understanding of the laws of weights and leverage. Some even saying that he discovered the secrets of the ancient Egyptians, and he used those secrets to construct this magnificent monument now, Leedsklin was a reclusive figure and he was known for his small stature. He was just five foot tall and he weighed around 90 pounds. But despite his physical limitations, he managed to construct a coral castle over the course of nearly 30 years from 1923 up to his death in 1951, using over 1,100 tonnes of oolite rock taken from a nearby quarry. One of its impressive features is its nine ton gate, which is balanced so precisely that it can be easily pushed open with just a touch of the finger. And this castle remains shrouded in mystery. Leeds Colin worked alone and he wouldn't allow anybody to observe him while he worked. And that led to questions about how he was able to move the massive stones. When asked how he did it, he said that if he could learn the secrets, then anybody could do it. And there were a couple of witnesses who said he made the blocks of stone float like moving balloons. And Lee Scullin claimed that he built the monument using a special technique that allowed him to move the massive stones by himself. And this technique was performed by a perpetual motion holder that he designed and built himself, allowing him to use his knowledge of magnetism to lift and move the huge stones alone. Now, there are many theories about how he was able to move the massive stones. Some people believe he levitated the rocks by singing to them with the use of supernatural powers. But regardless of the method, the construction is truly an impressive feat of engineering. And he sculpted over three million tons of oolite coral without any modern machinery or help. And one of the most impressive things about this monument is that it's not just a castle, but it also includes several other interesting carvings and structures within it. There's a two-storey tower that was actually used as his living quarters. And it also has a sundial, telescope and an obelisk. And if that's not enough to impress the sceptics and the naysayers, there's also a barbecue, a water well and a fountain. But what really stands out are the pieces of furniture that he created. There's a table that's in the shape of Florida and 25 rocking chairs, some of which were designed to look like present moons. And then there's a bathtub, beds, and he's even sculpted a throne. Now, some of these sculptures are said to have hidden meanings and astrological symbols that have yet to be deciphered. And the whole monument is said to have been built for a lost love, also referred to as his Sweet Sixteen. Coral Castles also appeared on the TV show Ancient Aliens, and it's featured the monument in several episodes. 
speculating about its possible ET origins. However, if Leeds Skillin did have an arcane knowledge of magnetism and the natural laws of physics that went beyond what is accepted by the mainstream academics today, then that would blow the ancient alien theories right out of the window and it would be more proof that humans are capable of great feats and that every structure that can't be explained is down to ET intervention. So there you have it, Coral Castle, an engineering marvel built by one man whose mystery continues to intrigue us even today. What are your thoughts on it, Thomas? Beautiful. It was my first ever reaction to it. Years ago, someone I worked with went on holiday down to Florida and didn't know about it and stumbled upon it and went to visit it and showed me the photographs. And I was like, this is so unbelievably beautiful. I just couldn't, not only the, the stonework, and, but the positioning of it and the way the flowers were, you know, landscaping and everything. And I hadn't got a clue what it was. I just thought it was an amusement park. And it wasn't until many years later when I saw it filmed by Freeman Fly on his channel. I don't know if it's still there, where he went to Coral Castle and spoke about it. And that just was, wow, this, this is something else. This guy was like a tiny man. Um, he was slightly and, you know, wasn't a, a big muscle man. And yet he used to overnight he would build these structures. Now, it's not inconceivable, you know, if you have the right equipment and so on. And working overnight in Florida makes sense because you're out the heat in the sun. But there are photographs out there that show these bizarre pulley systems that are not like, you know, what you would think a normal pulley system would be like. They're almost like there's enormous stones balancing on three three pieces of timber, lumber, that are really not capable of holding a weight that size. And I think he was a Freemason. There's a reason for this. Uh, the, there's lots of Freemasonic imagery in Coral Castle. It seems to have a similar vibe to Quinta de Regalia, Regalia in Sintra in Portugal. It has that same, and it's a very Freemasonic place. And that, that's about them. That's built those stoneworks there are for the mysteries of Freemasonry. So I think he was. Now, what kind of this sorcery did he use to make them? Well, I think it was Freemasonic knowledge that was probably kept in the lodges that he, he was allowed to use just as one time without telling anybody. And hence why he did it at night. There were stories of teenagers. Now, I don't know if this is true, but it's a good one. Of teenagers used to be hanging out there drinking and stuff and said that they used to see him at night performing rituals and incantations and there definitely was a couple of recorded freemasonic ceremonies held in the place over the years it was also actually moved by him it was in when a developer bought up the land where it was originally built he single-handedly moved it on a flatbed truck uh, to a new location and reassembled it even bigger again it's a remarkable story. The alien stuff just does my head in. I can't stand when they bring that stuff in. But uh, he, I think he had the secrets of the Masons. And this is why they're called Masons. And which went back to ancient Egypt and stuff like that. And uh, the story of him not having a high school degree, coming from Latvia. His girlfriend said he had mount, left him for a, a guy who was highly educated and he wanted to prove he wasn't a fool. Just, I mean, it's just a beautiful story and a beautiful looking place. And, a, you know, I, it's one of these kind of things. I don't want to know the truth because the the beauty of the mystery, the sacred mystery is enough. It, it is a very romantic place. And um, I watched a, a documentary about it with Lem Leonard Nimroy was narrating it. And it was fantastic. And the story, it, it's, it's very romantic and very nice. And I think it was a story of unrequited love. And he just wanted to prove a point. You know, he was a small man. He was five foot. He probably, she probably left him for some, maybe six foot and over. And he just wanted to... Um, yeah just show her that it's not all about the stature, how tall you are. Well, I love that story, if that's true. That's a beautiful story. And I, I, I want to I wanna believe that's true. I think that's one of the things of the 40 and stuff, although we do kind of like, 
you know, we look into things and we connect dots and we find different meanings. I often feel that we need to not lose sight of our folklorish elements of these things as well. And so I, out of, out of prejudice, and I think you too, I'm, I'm going to go with the he did it to, to win back in some kind of other way the love of his life who left him for a big burly muscle man who might have even been a you know a stonemason or something and he could show i could do this too without actually and then you know left a beautiful a beautiful legacy to the people of florida but i yeah. do believe he was a freemason I'm, I'm nearly convinced of that the the castle's open now to the public isn't it you can go there and have a look round. it's a national um tourist attraction very very popular at the moment and you used to let people in and charge them like a penny or something, yes. like a cursory admission fee. Yes. And then up to him being poorly, because he was building it until until he died. He was still working on that. And then one particular day, he just left a sign on the door that he'd handwritten, just go into the hospital back soon. <laughs> and uh, he got the bus and went to the hospital and he had why, a stroke. Um, why hasn't a movie been made of that, you know? I want to know why a movie has been made of that. But yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it's one of these things that's like you're glad it exists in the world. And Florida is very fortunate to have Coral Castle. I mean, what a gift to leave to the state and to the people and to the world, really. And uh, I'd love to go there one day. I saw a video, of, I remember it was a while back, from a, a promotional film from the 1950s. And it was before all the health and safety things took over. And the kids were playing with the big stone gate that rotates the entrance gate. And they're on a pivot, on it's like on a pivot. And uh, the, the stone kind of closed. And you see this woman bringing a baby through. And you're going, oh, my God, Jesus. You think the baby and the woman are going to be crushed? And it literally touches against her and instantly stops. It's absolutely perfectly balanced where it has no momentum of its own uh it's the, the, the two the two tons of weight of it doesn't matter no you can just apparently you can just touch it with your little finger and it'll open yeah i saw a video of a little boy they've got a they've got a gate around it now i saw recent pictures that they put a gate around it because of insurance and health and safety and all this nonsense but there is a little on that film i saw from the 50s or 60s a little boy is pushing it with his finger yeah, it would. Be, it must be amazing to see in the in the flesh because the pictures of it, the 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 large chairs around the table, uh, with the the crescent moons, they're magnificent. They are really regal. Oh yeah, that's the that's the Masonic part. I think that's some kind of Masonic Grand Lodge type setup there. But yeah, but it's wow, just one of the uh, you know Hollywood people really need to get uh, well. Don't make they'll make it woke or something. But I would love to see a movie made about it. Yeah, it's, it's a, it. a beautiful love story. Well, a story of unrequited love, and it just shows the creativity that can come out of a human being when faced with rejection or adversity, desperation. They don't call it the blues for nothing. And this is the whole thing. We live in an age where people, when they have a broken heart or a bad time, they go on a, a rampage and call their ex a psychopath on YouTube or something or make a fool of themselves or they go on psych meds or stuff like that. But in the olden days, they challenged it into art and they challenged it into music and they challenged, channeled it into, into Coral Castle. So there's a, there's, there's a lesson there for anyone that it's like when you have the, the broken heart or the, the pain inside you, to channel it into creative things. When you compare Coral Castle to the pyramids, you see that there's some similarities. They're both involved moving large quantities of stone from nearby quarries to where they were then sculpted. So it's highly likely that techniques involving um, reverse magnetism and unknown laws of physics regarding weight and balance were used to make the constructions. And he did say himself that if he could do it, anyone could do it. And he said that the perpetual motion holder that he used defies the laws of mainstream physics and in his book called current magnetic he makes reference to this perpetual motion holder 
been misunderstood by people due to the various aspects of um, the science that's taught in school being predominantly wrong. We're not being told how it really is uh, for the law of physics. Florida is about on the same latitude as Egypt, which I find interesting too as well. And is there something about the sun that makes these effects easier? We know that things like atomic explosions are very much detonations and nuclear reactions are related to the angle of the sun in the sky. And so are things like, uh, well, lots of things. Uh, there's another one too I was thinking of. But they, uh, the yeah, rocketry, launching rockets, that's why rockets flew from Cape Canaveral and not from like Canada, because the closer you are at the equator, certain things are easier. Uh, it's, it's like access to space is easier. So I, I do wonder if Florida was picked because it was on a similar latitude to the Giza Valley. Yeah, interesting, yeah. And just a, a small interesting factoid, um, the Billy Idol song, Sweet 16, was actually inspired by the story of um, Edward Leeds Skimlin, uh, excuse me, Edward Leeds Gamin. And that's a, that's one of his most beautiful songs as well. It's a wonderful song. I, I love that Bill Guy song. I didn't know about that. I thought it was about like, you think it's about a girl he knew in school in England or something. Wow, because it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Who would have thought Billy Idol was so sensitive? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you listen to that song now with fresh ears. Wow. So that's Coral Castle. Well, right, well, we're over at Craven Keel now in County Sligo. Thomas and myself again. Uh, now, we're going to have a quick look around the, the, t the tomb, but before that, we need to talk about the conference. Uh, like last year, we're going to start off with our book and, uh, and a film, and the Pendle Witch's book is out, and we're halfway through making the film, aren't we? Yeah. So we'll start off the day on the Saturday morning, and I'll, I'll put a list after this of all the other speakers, and I'll go through them. But as we stand, our expert, Thomas, is going to take us around the, around the curve and give us uh, a guiding tour. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, this is Creevy Keel Court Cairn in County Sligo, uh, in the northwest of Ireland. This is my favourite megalithic site in, in, in Sligo. And it's a, a court cairn which is unique to Ireland. We'll show you in the video later when he edits it. But there's a, a court area in front of the main chamber, which here is kind of a similar to West Tennant Long Barrow in England. It's a, a lot the, with the soil taken off. There's a couple of antechambers and a chamber at the back. And these only appear at a certain latitude across the north of Ireland from the Atlantic to the Irish Sea, only across a certain area. And uh, this is, uh, was a very famous site uh, because the locals were terrified of it for, for centuries because it was supposed to be a place where dark fairies lived, dangerous fairies. The she lived. And in 1947, a Harvard University archaeologist came here and cleared all the soil off. That's why it's gone uh, from the back part and opened, it, opened the, 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 the thing up. And that's the fairies never came back. So it was a classic example of the folklore being destroyed by archaeology. But this was covered. I think they should have put the, the soil back on top and left it the way it looked in the yeah, Neolithic yeah, time. Yeah. But it's about 6,000 years old. It's very, very big. It's very, they're very similar court cairns to the Neuragics in Sardinia, Sardinia yeah. in that the, you have the main chamber megalith buried in soil and you have like almost like a cow's horns at oh, the front. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Where, yeah, in, yeah, where in Sardinia they're like that a bit. They're like that, right? But the Irish court cairns are closer with the entrance. So probably the, the Neuragics in Sardinia in the Bronze Age was a big bull culture. Mm -hmm. And we know the ancient Irish were a bull culture and nowadays a bullshit culture. But that was a bull veneration stuff, you know. Time 
for the man who can read the skies like an open book with his keen intuition and sixth sense he can sense the shifts in the winds the fluctuations in the pressure and the subtle vibrations of the elements so sit back relax and let our psychic weather whisperer guide you through the twists and turns of the upcoming week's cosmic climate Well, this week's psychic weather is really a very serious warning. Uh, do not dance with madness. I have seen so much madness arising right now. And I'm not talking about Renfielding. Renfielding is a sort of a, it could be normies of Renfield. It could be NPCs or anyone who can Renfield. But this is the mentally, this is people with mental problems. And they're, they all seem to be firing off really badly at the moment. And there's something going on. There's some it's, there's people that have problems with mental health, people who suffer from mental illness. They have gone into overdrive right now. Now, this sometimes normally happens in springtime. I wrote a book called The Feed the Demons. And it, it, it was a, it, I wrote, I made up a database of when asked people when the worst things happened to them that were, were in a predatory, a predatory an individual attacked them or destroyed them or prayed them it was always the spring or the autumn and so we're in springtime now really and so this madness is for some reason this year i don't know why anyone i know who has a a bit of a problem and i'm trying to be as sensitive as sensitive as possible it, it is batshit crazy right now absolutely if there's so much mental illness right now and there's so much people who are not well, and it's, they're amplifying and off the scale and off their rocker. Um, is it the sun? Is it the electromagnetic spectrum? Is it the res human resonance? Is it the Kali Yuga? Is it the wave function collapse? I don't know, but madness is, is in the extreme, and do not be pulled into it. Do not be tempted to play into it. Do not be pulled into it. Do not become the bug in the bug zapper or the moth in the flame. Do not play or dance with madness for the next week or so. And this is Thomas Sheridan with the Psychic Weather. Thank you, Thomas. I'm just going to continue to keep my head down and limit time on social media and online because I think that's where a lot of it rears its ugly head. It's not so much, I don't know about so much out on the streets, I don't know, but certainly online is the, uh, when they've got the screen to protect them, they tend to go a little bit off the scale. So I'm just, uh, I just keep away. Or, or, or if they're bonkers, it tends to, it definitely amplifies it. Yeah. yeah. Good advice. Thank you. Yeah. And now it's time to dive into the magical world of literature and share some of the books from our own personal collections. These books have both influenced and left a lasting impression on us, earning themselves a permanent spot on our bookshelves. And we hope that by sharing them with you, we can inspire you to discover more exciting books to add to, add to your own collections. Today, I want to talk about a fascinating book called the triumph of the moon by ronald hutton i don't know if you can there now this book looks at the history of modern pagan witchcraft and its roots in the british occult revival of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and hutton's a respected historian of paganism and british folklore and his book takes you on a journey through various historical movements and figures that led to the modern pagan movement as we know it today from the Theosophical Society to Alistair Crowley to the influence of ancient mythology on modern witchcraft. He covers it all and it's a very, very in-depth book and it does take a while to read. It's a history book and not a guidebook. And one interesting aspect that the book does go into is the influence of both Dennis Wheatley and Alistair Crowley on the British occult revival of that early, 
early 20th century. And Hutton discusses their impact on popularising the idea of the occult and the supernatural within British culture. It also goes into great detail about Alistair Crowley's relationship and dealings with Gerald Gardiner. And Crowley was initially unimpressed with Gardiner's knowledge and understanding of the occult, but apparently later became a little bit more supportive of Gardiner's work. Hutton writes that Gardner's own claims about his relationship with Crowley should be viewed with quite some scepticism, as he was known to exaggerate and make up aspects of his own life and experiences. And the author's balanced approach to the subject matter makes The Triumph of the Moon a really valuable, valuable book for anybody interested in the history of modern paganism. British folklore and the occult. It's full of research and clear writing and it makes the book perfect for all readers. So if you're interested in the history and its roots and the occult revival, I highly recommend giving this book a try. I'm definitely going to get that. It sounds fabulous. As I say, yeah. it's a, a very, I mean, it takes a hell of a long time to get through it's packed with stuff and the print is minute, tiny. My book this week is The Celtic Magical Tradition, Ancient Wisdom of the Battle of Mytura by Steve Lemires. This is a rather unusual book. It was produced in 1992, written. And what he did was he did a kind of a chaos magic approach to the Irish mythological cycle. In a similar way that there's been magical books published out of the Necronomicon or Lovecraft's mythos, he had the Steve Flamir had done this with the actual story of the Battle of Moitura, the, the two of the Dana, the defeat of the Fomorians, but did it in terms of uh, a magical ritual. So there, it, it is also heavily influenced by the Bhagavad Gita of the Vedic tradition. And I think he was a groundbreaking work, and I think that's what he really did. He rediscovered that these were not just mythical stories, but also magical workings. So the book begins with things like your journey to the four cities over the sea, you know, on a mystical, a ceremonial sense of the two of the Danon. You select your magical ritual for, the, for your magical weapon from the four weapons of the great treasures of Ireland. And then you proceed to go on a quest where you invoke the Dagda, you defeat the Fomorians, and you bring in all the other aspects of uh, the Irish mythological cycle in relation, and have the, the Marmorgan and everything else in there, to a, a magical ritual. It has all the exercises beginning right through the stages, very similar to kind of Golden Dawn thing, and also a bit like Simon's Necronomicon. But... Um, it's definitely, a, if though it's dealing with an ancient mythology, it definitely it came out of chaos magic, late 70s, 80s world. You can kind of feel that. I don't know if it did or not, but that's how it feels to me. And it's not an easy book to get. The Irish Times actually gave this a very, very favorable review, which is quite interesting. Well, back then in 92 on the real newspaper. But um, yeah, so that's the Irish magical tradition. Sorry, the Irish, the Irish Celtic magical tradition, ancient wisdom, of the Battle of Mytura by Steve Lemires. And it's it's a hard one to get, but you'll be a pick them up now and again on eBay. I've had this one for years. I bought it in a bookshop, but it has all the steps of the magical rituals inside it and uh, different exercises and different works. And I've never, I'm honest with you, I've never, I haven't done the stuff in it, but I've read it and found it fascinating and, and, and novel and quite genius in many ways. And it's sort of like the classic thing that like chaos magic you can make a you can make a ritual out of anything and this very much fits in that so uh yeah very very hard one to get but if you can get it you'll definitely like it that's very very interesting would you mind giving us an example of a couple of the exercises in there just what the, the titles of them i don't you don't mean to, you have to run through them yeah well it begins with so for, it starts out with the he goes over the legend of the Battle of Moitura, which is a battle where the two of the Dan and the Fomorians fought for the ownership of Ireland. And it starts off with a practical work, the preparation for battle. 
So going on a quest, the psychological, spiritual quest. Then you journey to Phalias, Gorias, Phineas, and Muras, the four cities of the two of the Italian, which is the Atlantean kind of mythology. You prepare your magical weapons. You prepare your working area. So we're really in the kind of Golden Dawn type, you think. And then you have exercises revolving around Celtic ancient Irish gods, Dagda, Ongwe, Angus, the god of love, and so on. And then there's a basic ritual at the back, and then you have a kind of a, a tarot working at the back, and then a thing towards so sovereignty. And then there's a very good afterword in the back. I'll just read the I'll just read a bit of the introduction. It is often assumed that by those starting on a magical or spiritual quest, that only Eastern and Oriental religions and philosophy provide accurate teachings and instructions concerning the correct way of living in harmony with oneself and one's environment. It is also commonly assumed that there is not and never has been a complementary Western or native system. This, however, is definitely not the case. It will be demonstrated in this book that there is an equally valid and viable Western tradition that meets and satisfies the physical, mental, and spiritual needs of the practitioner as does any Oriental system. Sufficient information and guidance will be given throughout the book, which will enable the reader on a completion to progress to what level he or she desires, either alone or as a member of a group practicing the native tradition. And there you go. So he wanted to take basically a, a, a an Eastern philosophy and tie and extrude the Irish one through it uh, to prove that it could be done. And he does. He does prove it. It, it is like he he, he did it. He, he he nailed it. It's very interesting. I'm, I'm very interested in that. I'm going to have a look for that. Thank you. Yeah, and it's different, isn't it? It's like a it's a very it's like one of the most kind of unusual books in my collection. Yeah, that's a good, a real gem. Yeah, and it's got some nice illustrations in it of that kind of Irish sort of like uh, Celtic lithographic artwork, that kind of thing, you mm. know. Not much though, only a few others, but yeah, you know, there's the the magic, the magical boat. So it's all it's like a mystical journey. So thanks for joining us for this week's Hocus Focus. We hope you enjoyed the show and that it left you wanting more. Be sure to tune in next week for another thrilling episode full of high strangeness. Until then, keep your eyes peeled for the unexpected and remember, anything is possible. And also remember next week, we're going to be over on Beyond Room 313. So if you haven't already, make sure you've subscribed and hit that notification bell. And give us a share and a bit of love and spread us around. People have been joining who didn't know anything about my work or anything. They're suddenly saying they love the show. So uh, let's let's bring in some new uh, friends who can join the conversation. More the merrier. And before we go, it's time for the Tarot of the Week. And this week's card is quite apt, really. The Ten of Swords. And the Ten of Swords depicts a man lying face down, lifeless, with ten swords plunged into his back. And despite this gruesome scene, a red cape covers the lower half of his body. And that's a symbol of dignity and death, in death as he departs this world. And the ominous dark sky above represents the end of a chapter. But the rising sun on the horizon signifies a new dawn and a renewed sense of hope. The calm sea in the background provides comfort, reminding us that once the darkness have lift, has lifted, things do not appear half as bad as they were imagined, and a feeling of relief comes from this morning light. The card may indicate a painful ending, but it also promises a fresh start and the potential for growth and change. Remember that even in the face of adversity, there is always a silver lining waiting to be discovered. You could be feeling deeply hurt and betrayed, experiencing the intense pain of being stabbed in the back and beating yourself up about it. You could also be stewing over all the hurts that have been done to you, making you feel defeated and stuck. It could be a possible situation that is being over-dramatised in the mind. After all, it only takes one sword to kill, not ten. The best course of action before you arise is to reflect on whatever it is that's brought you to this point and learn from it. 
it's important to make any necessary changes to avoid being here again in the future. And remember that pain is a natural part of life. It's how we respond to it that matters. The Ten of Swords urges you to let go of a situation and embrace a new beginning. The card read here today is in read in a general sense, and it could be referring to a situation, a person, a job, a way of thinking. It could even be the light at the end of the tunnel after one of those major bursts of a water pipe like so many of us have seemed to have experienced lately. But whatever it may mean for you, the sun has arisen and the dark night is over. Yes, it's uh, the, 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 what everything bad that has happened has happened. So that's the end of it. it, it it's not as brutal on the surface as the imagery shows, as you said, the rising sun in the background, the new day. But I, you know, my philosophy of no contact ever again, like when a situation is hopeless, it's never going to be resolved. It's never going to be happy. Just and I mean, just just walk away. Just forget about them. Don't even try to psychoanalyze it. Just go on. But that that's the card I always think of for the no contact ever again. The ten of swords. You know, just just cut your losses. Forget about forget about you know revenge or anything like that. And just walk away. And you know, of course, sometimes they come after you, but and don't they won't let you walk away. But uh, that's always the best policy. And that's the, that's the card of no contact ever again. That could also be a very useful card and a magic card and a magical working to close a ritual. Right, that's interesting. It, uh, like you say, it's, it's saying there's nothing for you down this path anymore. It's it's dead, it's finished. So get off this path. Yeah, kind of annihilation gnosis type thing. Well, everybody, good night. I'll see you next week. Good night.